March 21, 1943. Bay of Biscay, 47 degrees north, 6 degrees west. Captain Lieutenant Heinrich Lehmann Willenbrock stood on the bridge of U-96, breathing in the salt air of a moonless night. The diesel engines rumbled beneath his feet as his boat charged its batteries on the surface, a ritual that had kept German U-boats alive since the war's first days. His lookouts scanned the darkness with Zeiss binoculars, searching for the telltale exhaust plumes of approaching aircraft. They saw nothing. They heard nothing. The Matox radar detector, mounted on the conning tower and nicknamed the Biscay Cross by the crew, remained silent. Seven miles away, invisible in the darkness, a Royal Air Force Coastal Command Wellington bomber had already locked Type 2 71 centimetric radar onto U-96's hull. The crew had 12 seconds before the aircraft would be overhead with depth charges. They didn't know. The technology that had protected them, the assumption that radar waves could be detected before aircraft arrived, had become obsolete in a single technological leap. The British had changed the rules of engagement without announcement, without warning, and German submariners would die by the hundreds before their commanders understood what had happened. This is the story of how 10 centimetres of wavelength destroyed Germany's greatest strategic weapon, and how the men who sailed beneath the waves discovered, too late, that the ocean's darkness no longer offered sanctuary. Between May 1943 and May 1944, the Kriegsmarine would lose 245 U-boats. Most crews never understood what killed them. They simply ceased to exist between one radio transmission and eternal silence. If you're enjoying this deep dive into the story, hit the subscribe button and let us know in the comments from where in the world you are watching from today. The central question that haunted every U-boat commander in the spring of 1943 was simple. How were Allied aircraft finding submarines in total darkness? The Matox detectors worked perfectly. They had been detecting ASV Mark II radar since their introduction in August 1942. U-boat crews religiously monitored the receivers, diving immediately when the distinctive warning tone indicated radar illumination. This doctrine had proven effective for eight months. Survival rates for boats crossing the Bay of Biscay, that deadly 400-mile transit between French bases and open Atlantic hunting grounds, had actually improved. Then, in March 1943, U-boats began dying in darkness. No Metox warning, no visual contact with aircraft. Just sudden, catastrophic attacks from aircraft that appeared without prelude. Crews who survived these attacks reported the same bewildering pattern. Running surfaced under excellent conditions, good visibility, alert lookouts, functional Metox detector showing no contacts, then aircraft overhead dropping depth charges or bombs before the diving alarm could even sound. The attacks came with such speed that most boats never fully submerged. Aircraft caught them in the vulnerable transition, conning tower hatches still open, diesels still engaged, compressed air venting as tanks flooded, the depth charges detonated alongside partially submerged hulls, fracturing pressure hulls and sending 50 men to deaths measured in seconds rather than the prolonged agony of a disabled boat sinking slowly beyond crush depth. Part 2. Building the World, U-Boat Doctrine To understand the catastrophe that befell the U-Boat arm in 1943, one must first understand the operational doctrine that had made German submarines the most effective commerce raiders in naval history. The U-Boat was not, despite popular imagination, primarily a submerged vessel, it was a surface raider that could submerge when threatened. This distinction was not semantic but fundamental to every aspect of U-boat design, crew training and tactical employment. The Type 7 C U-boat, the backbone of Germany's submarine fleet with 703 examples built during the war, spent roughly 90% of its operational time on the surface. This was not preference but necessity dictated by physics and engineering. The twin MAN diesel engines, generating 2,800 brake horsepower, could push the boat to 17 knots on the surface, while simultaneously charging the massive battery banks that powered the electric motors for submerged operations. Underwater, those same electric motors could manage only 7.5 knots for a maximum of 80 nautical miles before the batteries exhausted and the boat was forced to surface. 
These numbers meant that a U-boat's effective operational radius, its ability to reach distant hunting grounds and return to base, depended entirely on surface running. A boat operating in the mid-Atlantic, a thousand miles from its French base, needed to spend the vast majority of its patrol on the surface simply to position itself where merchant convoys might be found. Submerging was a defensive measure, a temporary refuge from aircraft or surface escorts, not a normal cruising mode. This operational reality shaped every aspect of U-boat tactics. Boats hunted on the surface, where lookouts with excellent optics could spot convoy smoke at 20 miles. They attacked on the surface whenever possible, where speed and manoeuvrability allowed multiple torpedo shots and rapid repositioning. They transited on the surface, racing to intercept positions radioed by U-boat headquarters in Lorient or by other boats already in contact with convoys. The night surface attack had become doctrine, refined through three years of combat into a precise tactical system. U-boats would shadow convoys during daylight hours from beyond visual range, tracking by hydrophone and periodic periscope. Observations After sunset, they would surface and race ahead of the convoy, positioning themselves for night surface attacks that exploited the U-boat's low silhouette against the dark ocean. British escorts their radar unable to distinguish surfaced submarines from wave clutter and their sonar useless against surface targets found these attacks nearly impossible to counter. If you're enjoying this deep dive into the story, hit the subscribe button and let us know in the comments from where in the world you are watching from today. Gross Admiral Karl Dönitz, commander of the U-boat arm and later commander-in-chief of the entire Kriegsmarine, had built his entire strategic concept around these night surface attacks his doctrine called for wolf pack tactics, groups of 15 to 20 boats concentrating against a single convoy, all attacking on the surface in coordinated waves that overwhelmed escort defences through sheer numbers. This system had nearly severed Britain's Atlantic lifeline in 1942, sinking over 6 million tonnes of Allied shipping. The key to survival in this surface warfare doctrine was early warning of air attack. U-boats were helpless against aircraft when caught on the surface. The deck gun, an 88mm weapon effective against merchant ships, was useless against aircraft approaching at 150 miles per hour from above. The boat's only defence was crash diving, flooding tanks and submerging before aircraft could close to attack range. A well-trained crew could clear the bridge and submerge to periscope depth in 30 seconds, to safe depth of 60 feet in 45 seconds. But this defence required warning. Lookouts needed to spot the aircraft at sufficient distance, or radar detectors needed to sense the radar emissions before aircraft reached attack range. This requirement drove German radar detector development and deployment. Part 3. Building the World, METOX, and the Illusion of Safety. First German radar detector, called METOX after its French manufacturer, entered U-boat service in August 1942. The device was crewed by later standards a simple receiver tuned to detect the 1.5-metre wavelength emissions of British ASV. Mark II radar, the standard radar equipping Royal Air Force Coastal Command aircraft. The receiving antenna, a distinctive cross-shaped affair mounted on a wooden pole that could be raised from the conning tower, earned the nickname Biscay Cross from U-boat crews who first employed it during Bay of Biscay transits. METOX was never sophisticated technology, the device detected radar illumination but provided no directional information and no range estimate. When the receiver detected ASV Mark II emissions, it simply produced an audio tone in headphones worn by a dedicated operator stationed in the control room. The tone's intensity increased as the transmitting aircraft approached, giving the operator a crude sense of whether the threat was closing or receding. That was all. No display, no sophisticated processing, just a tone that meant one thing, dive immediately. Despite this simplicity, METOX proved remarkably effective. ASV Mark II radar, operating at 1.5-metre wavelength, could detect a surfaced U-boat at approximately 12 miles under optimal conditions. The METOX receiver, being passive and thus not limited by the need to receive reflected signals, could detect ASV Mark II transmissions at approximately 20 to 30 miles depending on atmospheric conditions and the aircraft's altitude. 
This detection range advantage gave U-boat crews 10 to 15 minutes of warning, ample time to crash dive and evade. The psychological impact of METOX exceeded its tactical value. For the first time since aircraft had become a significant anti-submarine threat, U-boat crews possessed a defence that didn't rely on human eyesight. Lookouts, no matter how alert, could be defeated by clouds, haze, or simple human fallibility. METOX was tireless, scanning continuously, detecting electromagnetic emissions invisible to human senses. Crews learned to trust the device absolutely. When METOX remained silent, they believed themselves safe from air attack. This belief became doctrine. By late 1942, U-boat standing orders required continuous METOX monitoring whenever surfaced. If the detector warned of radar emissions, the boat dove immediately, no exceptions. If METOX remained silent, boats could remain surfaced even in areas of heavy air patrol, confident that any radar-equipped aircraft would trigger the detector before reaching attack range. Survival statistics supported this confidence. U-boat losses to aircraft in the Bay of Biscay, previously a killing ground where Coastal Command had enjoyed turkey shoots against transit submarines, declined markedly after METOC's introduction. Dönitz himself endorsed this confidence. In December 1942, he informed U-boat commanders that METOX had robbed the enemy of his advantage in radar location. Intelligence reports from captured British air crews confirmed that RAF Coastal Command was indeed equipped primarily with ASV Mark II radar. The strategic picture seemed clear. Germany had defeated British radar through the simple expedient of detecting it before it could guide effective attacks. U-boat crews constructed an entire tactical framework around METOX reliability. They would run surfaced in areas where aircraft might be present, posting a dedicated METOX operator in addition to bridge lookouts. At the first warning tone, the alarm would sound, the bridge would clear, and the boat would dive to safety. Between August 1942 and February 1943, this system worked exactly as designed. Boats with functional METOX detectors survived. Boats whose METOX had failed, or whose operators had become careless, died. The German faith in METOX was so complete that when U-boats began dying in darkness in March 1943, the initial assumption was operator error or equipment failure. Surviving commanders reported attacks without METOX warning, but headquarters suspected the crews had simply been negligent, that operators had removed their headphones, or that equipment had malfunctioned. The alternative, that British aircraft had developed a new radar operating on different wavelengths that METOX couldn't detect, seemed impossible. German radar experts had assured Dönitz that centimetric radar, operating at wavelengths of 10 centimetres or less, was theoretically possible but practically infeasible. The magnetrons required to generate such high-frequency, high-power emissions were, according to German physics, impossible to manufacture in operational quantities. The technology that would destroy the U-boat arm's operational security was developed not through dramatic breakthrough, but through patient refinement of principles already understood. British radar research had begun in earnest in 1935, when Robert Watson Watt demonstrated that radio waves could detect aircraft at meaningful ranges. By 1939, Britain possessed the Chain Home Early Warning System, a network of coastal radar stations operating at wavelengths between 10 and 13 metres that could detect incoming German bomber formations at ranges exceeding 100 miles. But these long wavelength radars, while effective for